Chindani, welcome. A uh, uh, repeat guest, get nice and close to the to the microphone. Last year we had Vinny on, talking about his new book, The New Polymath, and uh, which essentially uh, a polymath is an individual with expert with a, with a wide variety of expertise, right? Um, I think I called you a Renaissance man. Um, you were very humble and said, "No, Dave, I'm not a Renaissance man," but you knew a lot of people and that were Renaissance men of technology, and you profile them in your book. And we're here to talk about a new book. It's called the IT Switch Hitter. Is that right? The Technology Switch Hitter. The Technology Switch Hitter, right? Better than the IT. Better title. So uh, I'm not good at titles. but um, So tell us about the Technology Switch Hitter. It sounds like you know, part two of uh, the new polymath. First of all, how'd the new polymath go? Maybe you could summarize the premise of the book, and then we can talk about the, uh, the Technology Switch Hitter. Well, thank you for having me again. You're welcome. Good, good to see you at another event. Good to see your show continue to grow. So thank you. Um, Dave, the new polymath, as you, as you summarized, was about this new world where we are seeing companies learn to take a little bit of information technology, a little bit of biotech, a little bit of nanotech, a little bit of clean tech, a little bit of health tech, come up with just amazing new products not just because they wanted to show off and say hey we've got all these disciplines but because they're trying to solve some really what i call grand challenges we face you know as mankind right so there's um, ecological issues there's health issues there are information technology issues that this combination of technologies is allowing us to solve so polymath renaissance man meant to describe these companies that are learning to embed so many different disciplines. How is the book done? Oh, it's been, uh, it's done well, but more importantly, I've had a chance to go present at probably 50 different events around the world and talk about this new world of compound innovation. So, you know, it's probably exposed the idea to another 15, 20, 25,000 people as part of the events, right? So in that sense, been very gratifying. What are some of the events that you've done? Oh, cloud event in London, Capgemini in Amsterdam, uh, a Lexmark event in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, all over the iSchool school in Toronto. Book signings at all of them, or uh, yes, and but more importantly, you know, just a very wide range of. Um, you know, I was at Arizona State uh, in Tempe bunch of students and alum and professors, very different setting from, you know, some of the more corporate oriented events that I presented at. Right. Just, just, just great to see so many different audiences interested in innovation and, and, and so on. So we're talking about um, solving some of the problems. Um, I wonder if you could go in, and we talked about this a little bit last year, but for those of, of those folks in the audience who aren't familiar with the book, maybe give us some examples of some of the problems that, um, that you're talking about that that the new polymath, the, uh, the, the technology renaissance individual is helping to solve? So, you know, one, one example from the book was something called the GE Net Zero Project, right? In their view, none of us should have to pay utility bills. So they have an here, initiative. Here. <laughs> uh, in their world, uh, you know, they're looking at each one of us, in fact, being able to sell back to the electricity grid a bunch of power. Now, how do you do that? To be able to do that, their vision is we would have next generation solar panels. We would have scaled down wind turbines at our home. We would have next generation LED lighting, appliances that are smart. So, you know, we can have the spin cycle at six o'clock and the wash cycle at nine o'clock. We would have interfaces to the smart grids that utilities are building. We would have all kinds of home energy managers you know, so when you step back, you look at it and you go, what is this initiative? Is it an information technology initiative? Yes, it is, because it's got software and sensors and so on. Is it a clean tech initiative? Of course it is. Is it a nanotech initiative going forward? Because some of the you know, technologies involve next generation composites and so on. Of course it is. So a combination of a whole bunch of sciences coming together in one initiative. Okay. That, that's incredibly visionary. I mean, you think about humans becoming a power generation node selling energy back to the energy companies who then would presumably offset a lot of the billions in capital expense that they have to go through oh, and still profit from being able to resell that energy. To Some of the utilities it. call it their 
next power plant because it means they don't have to invest that much capex mm. in a new power plant. Right. 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 So they're willing to come up with variable pricing if we consume less or can sell back to them uh, power that we may be generating. Right. So. It, 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 you know, all this has to be worked through over the next few years. But in Germany, it's amazing to see how much of this is already happening. A lot of German farms and houses are selling back to the grid. So the technology switch hitter sounds like um, a, a very thematic, uh, picking up on the new polymath. And you know, it's interesting, Vinny, we were just here a short year ago talking about it, right. and it's amazing how much has changed since. I mean. You know, the role of the data scientist, for example. We were just talking about all, all of, to Oliver Bushman about the changing role of the CIO, how infrastructure applications and devices are completely flipping that role on its head, the importance of, of security and the CISO, uh, et cetera. So you wouldn't have thought that in a year so much had changed that it would be fodder for a, a new development, new book. But um, talk about what's new and uh, the technology switch hitter and, you know, why the book, why now? So... It's actually a slightly different theme than what you just talked about. Okay. It, it talks about two converging trends that I see. One is that traditional technology buyers are learning to embed technology in their products and become technology vendors. So that's one side of the switch hitter equation. What do I mean? So Nike shoes have sensors. Mm -hmm. Cars have all kinds of sensors and software and satellite support. Grills have Bluetooth. Moen has remote controls for showers. I cannot find a single industry. You know, when I started to do my research, I thought maybe eight or 10 industry, medical devices, auto, et cetera, were leading the charge. But I'm now up to 30 industries that are coming up with smart products, smart services, right? So I'm talking to townships that are coming up with a next generation parking garage that have sensors and parking, you know, to tell us which parking spaces are empty, next generation charging stations for electrical vehicles. I cannot find an industry that is not thinking about technology embedded product. So in that sense, these companies are learning to become technology vendors because now they have to think about spare parts. Now they're learning about, my God, Moore's Law. Software Changes. testing. Yeah, exactly. Huge issue. Got to retrain their channel. Mm -hmm. Got to retrain their sales force. They're learning about Moore's Law, right? Mm -hmm. Think about GPS when it first came out in cars. It was three, four, five thousand dollars. Well, the salesperson still expects to charge that. You can pull out your iPhone and say, "Why would I pay you five thousand dollars for that?" You know. So, so they're learning all these new nuances of, of becoming technology vendors. Okay. Okay. So that's one vector. One, one. On the other hand, the more I look at, particularly the consumer tech industry, um, Dave, if you peel the onion behind an Apple or an Amazon or a Google or a Facebook, the well-run ones, it is amazing the industrial best practices these companies have deployed. Okay? So you go into the Apple retail store, the average retailer who's been in business 100 years drools about Apple's retail metrics. You know, the sales per square foot, the consumer satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at Facebook's data centers, this is stuff that IBM and Accenture should have been designing. I mean, it is quantum better than what the corporate data center is today. If you look at Amazon supply chain innovations, right, postal injections and so on, this is stuff that Walmart and FedEx used to do 20 years ago, okay? These vendors are becoming the new buyers in the sense that they are propagating new industrial best practices that now the P&Gs and the, and the Kimberly Clarks are saying, my God, why aren't we doing that, right? So you see the other vector. These technology vendors are becoming more like buyers. They're becoming the new best practice leaders. On the other hand, buyers are becoming more like technology vendors. So the thesis of the book is, anymore, we can't pretend to be just a buyer or a vendor, right? We can't just say I'm a consumer of technology or I'm a producer of technology. We've got to become at both sides. You know, and that has some dramatic impact on IT, right? Because IT has traditionally been a consumer and deployer of technology. Now they're being forced into becoming producers of technology. On the other hand, you know, we can't afford to have software vendors who say, I deserve 90% gross margins, because these customers understand how to produce technology, how to deploy it. They understand the economics of technology much better than they did 10 years ago. Okay. So there's some profound impact 
that the industry is going to go through. It's an interesting uh, premise, Vinny. So, I mean, essentially, you, you, you're by implication saying that the way in which traditional buyers are actually applying technology is becoming maybe more important than the traditional way in which we as an industry have looked at, 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 at um, the sellers of technology. For example, Microsoft software having such an impact on be, because of an operating system that, that compared to the examples this, you just gave, it just seems outdated, right? That an operating system would have all that value. The value really is in the way in which, whether it's automobile companies, you mentioned medical device companies, manufacturers are applying technology to create new business capabilities. Uh, absolutely, and quite often, what's interesting is if you go to Daimler, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Guys who make Mercedes. They have a thousand software engineers who have nothing to do with the CIO. It reports to the R&D and product engineering group, right? So over and over again, I'm seeing examples of companies, buyers of technology, who are, because they're deploying technology and product, are very worried about the brand, they're very worried about the product, are learning to uh, become, you know, deploy a new version of technology consumption and technology manufacturing. Right. It, 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 it's dramatic, actually. Yeah, Many you, of them are avoiding IT, IT in their in their product areas. Yeah, but they're certainly not avoiding technology. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, it's the, all the, about technology. You know, the new form factors, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, phenomenon that I heard at an event a couple of months ago is what I call the Monday morning quarterback. Okay. The dramatic difference between all of us the technologies we have Sunday night, right? The HDTVs and the iPod, the iPads and the iPods at home, the home entertainment at home, and then we go in Monday morning to the UI and the old laptops and the and the old technology is so dramatic, mm -hmm. right? That many CIOs are finally saying, "Bring your own technology." There's a term called BYOT. Yeah, right. bring your home technologies. Let's work with that, right? Now. Many of the CEOs are going to the CIOs and saying, where's my iPad? But the smarter the CEOs are saying, there is a consumer out there that is used to the iPad and Google and Facebook. What can I sell to them? You know, why does my product have to be 10 years old? Why can't it be a new form factor which embeds technology, which embeds industrial design principles that an Apple has shown that the consumer is ready for, right? So there's, there's a revolution going on. Yeah, Apple sort of paved the way for mobile adoption, and now we're here at Sapphire. We're talking to Vinnie Mershandani, who's the author of the new Polymath. He's got a new book coming out called The Technology Switch Hitter. We're talking about the premise of that book. I mean, Vinnie, it's really, you know, you're a former analyst. You, you've, you've gone deep, done a lot of good work. Um, to me, this is a new, new take, a deeper take on the whole consumerization of IT. And people have been talking about that and sort of scratching the surface. You're really getting deep into how those technologies are becoming embedded. You know, IBM talks about the smarter planet. There's right. undertones of that smarter planet. It's a great vision. Um, but you're really coming up with some examples and then sort of combining that with this notion of the consumer tech drive and how companies like Amazon and Facebook are completely changing industry. And not just changing the, the technology industry, mm. but how they're inspiring the sick codes that have nothing to do with technology to also become technology vendors. I mean, that is the, the big awakening in a number of companies where they say, if a consumer is used to a Kindle, they're used to, a, they, they will likely try a medical device that looks like this. They likely try a lawnmower, which is much more technologically savvy than it was five years ago. They're much more, much more likely to try a new service that is technologically savvy than they were a few years ago. Okay, I mean, if you look at Mary Meeker's numbers, right? We have so many devices, so many, you know, so many web services in our daily life. Why wouldn't we try a new form factor in any product, right? We're used to books becoming Kindles. Why wouldn't we try that with how we refill Walgreens prescriptions, or how we look at shoes, or how we look at? You just saw a commercial for. Uh, you, you know, Under Armour here. You know the shirt they had with the uh, with the uh, uh, sensor. Yeah, yeah. smart uh, shirt. It's a smart <laughs> shirt, right? It's, uh, smart products are everywhere. Vinny, what do you what does this mean for data, right? Because um, we're talking about oh my God. devices. You're talking you know, about big data. Billions of devices, <laughs> and, and and every one of these devices, these embedded devices, has microprocessors. It's got tons of lines of code, and it's generating data. It's a sensor on the internet. 
Um, there are those who believe that, that as open source software increasingly commoditizes traditional software, Microsoft, SAP, IBM, et cetera, that data becomes the next source of competitive advantage. Do you, do you share that vision and, and as it, in regards to the work that you've done and the research that you've done, do you see that fitting into your scenarios here? I, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost to the point where our current definition of big data is going to be outdated in a couple of years. It's going to be tiny data looking back. Correct. Right, really. Correct. Now, you know, there are some exciting opportunities, you know, from the analysis of that data. There's also a whole bunch of new ethical considerations as we now share even more personal data through our devices. I mean, privacy issues. And oh, God. Like I mean, you know, we haven't even, you know, now we'll have smart medical devices that will be transmitting other data. We'll be, we'll be transmitting all kinds of location data. We'll be transmitting all kinds of, um, you know, food data as our appliances, um, you know, collect information on mm -hmm. what we're cooking and when we're cooking and all that. We haven't even touched the surface in terms of privacy issues that are coming up. You know, let's talk about that a little bit because there's such talk about security in our industry and, and um, not a lot of talk, it's certainly at the CIO level, the traditional enterprise CIO level, about privacy. Um, and based on what you just said, it's going to become increasingly important. It's not the same as security. There's relationships there, but, but there's also business practices and, and ethics and maybe new laws that have to come down that really adjudicate privacy in a, in a much different way than <clears throat> security. In some ways, security is, is intellectually more clean cut. I want to be secure. Privacy, it's like, well, where do you draw the line? David, the funny thing is, let me go back to the new polymaths, right, and the 40 or 50 presentations I've done. Every time I go to a campus setting, the chapter on ethics gets a lot of attention. When I go into a business setting, I don't even raise the topic because it's a very uncomfortable discussion in a business setting. Unfortunately, you know, most companies would rather just avoid the topic. They, they know it's coming, but they'd rather avoid the topic. And it's not just privacy. You know, I had a chapter in ethics in the, in the book which went into you know, a whole bunch of new uh, other ethical considerations that are coming up with clean technologies and so on. It's not a very comfortable discussion. In fact, one of the guys I quoted in the book made a great point, which was, we don't have a Ten Commandments for our industry, you know, which is, anytime we unleash a new technology, we kind of just throw it out there and wait for society to react, right? We don't have a framework for saying, hey, um, you, know, you talk about data, right? People collect data knowing fully well it's at risk of losing it, right? Isn't it much better not to collect that data? But we just assume, we just, you know, we kind of accept that it's okay to collect more and more data. You know, so, like I said, it, 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 I don't think we'll resolve the issue in the next couple of minutes, but it's not a very comfortable discussion no, in but, the industry. But it'd be worthwhile framing the issue, because I, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, and we've, with the Cube and SiliconANGLE and Wikibon, we've been covering a lot of the whole big data issues. It's hot, right? You know, right. the game, and we, we want to be where the action is. And, we did the Strata conference, and we talked to Tim O'Reilly about this mm -hmm. issue of, of privacy versus security. And I thought he had a good angle on it. He basically said, look, the, this is an opportunity for companies. So uh, I see the same thing. Companies don't want to talk about it. It's almost like, eh, we'll figure that out some other day, or, or it's security. We'll, we'll solve security, we'll, we'll take care of privacy too. Tim's take on it was different. He sees this as an opportunity, as an opt-in opportunity, if you will. Like when we're on our mobile devices and we want to find a place, it, and Google asks us, can we use your location? We say, sure, because we're, trying, we're getting value right. out of that interaction. And his, his premise was that the data, as data becomes more value, uh, valuable, as organizations package that data, it becomes an opportunity. And as a consumer, I'm going to want to opt-in. Your, your example about you know, cooking devices conveying information about what's being cooked and when, and, and there's, there's potentially a way to turn that into a rich data source of information for a consumer that I might like to have access to, you know, whether it's you know, recipes or other ideas. I, I don't really know, I can't really envision that, but do you, do you see that as you, know, as you look out, you take your telescope out as the potential bit flip here in this industry on privacy, where consumers are saying, all right, I, I want to opt in because I see a greater good both for me and, and, and my colleagues, my, my peers. Well, quite often we don't give them the choice, right? 
And if you give them the choice, most consumers would probably opt in, but they wouldn't want that shared in every single scenario that they can't think about, right? So, I mean, the thorny issue is, is um, if you ask the consumers, that's one decision point which freezes many of them. The second thing is, if you ask them where it can be used, it's too confusing. It's too confusing, yeah. right? So. That, 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 that's what I'm saying. We don't have an industry framework, mm. and so everybody kind of goes along and says, "Well, I'm sure some lawyer somewhere will figure this out." It, it's somebody else's issue. We don't take responsibility for, you know, having a framework as an industry. What um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about Sapphire. So we always have such <laughs> interesting conversations in Sapphire. We don't even talk about SAP, but right. so. You know, SAP is a company. We, we last year we heard the co CEO discussion. Hey, we got co CEOs, Kumbaya, and it seems right. to be working pretty well. And right. So hats off to those guys. We have we've had them both on the cube. We had Jim Hagem and Schnabe yesterday, and we've had Bill McDermott on earlier, and they seem to be doing a good job there. The Sybase acquisition was fresh. Right. Like okay, we were kind of scratching our heads. All right. right. Mobile really, and like yeah, really. Um, so that's good. So we're seeing this transformation. We've 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 seen a lot of, of the analogy of the uh, uh, the the app store. You just heard their CIO talking about that, running their business on on on, on iPads and so forth. But the the fact of the matter is that SAP, the predominance of SAP's business, like many of the enterprise companies, is maintenance. Right? right. They're, they're they're making money by extracting rent from their customers. And right. Oracle does that. Symantec does that. That's the name of the game. Sure. Uh, I, I get the sense that SAP is really trying to innovate. They're pouring money into R and D, and they are trying to turn this steamship. But there is that's going to take a long time, isn't it? I mean, we're, the marketing is seems to be way ahead of the actual dollars. Is that a fair perception on my part, or am I? Oh no. I mean, I, I think it's spot on. First of all, uh, Jim and Bill, very compatible. Mm. We had dinner with Jim on Sunday. You know, hell of a nice guy. I mean, you know, these are these are nice, fun executives to be around. Okay, so you know, SAP. And in the case of McDermott, he's cool. <laughs> well, I, 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 frankly, I find Schnabe very, very personable. One of them. Oh, absolutely. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's got a great sense of humor. You know, yeah. humble in a, in a lot of ways. So, yeah. you know, this is a good company to do business with. You know, they're making people it easy. like doing business right. with SAP. Right. Yeah. Um, the I this year even more than last year I'm convinced that you know this is a legacy vendor right which keeps doing nice things nice extensions to the legacy code but they kind of feel compelled to talk about mobile this and social this and cloud this because it's fashionable for them to talk about it the core of the company the customers keep writing them checks not not just because it's Good, good rental model is because you know, they run the backbone of many of the biggest companies in the world. Mm. Okay, and I think the one thing I'd like SAP to to just acknowledge is we may not be the most innovative. We're not an Apple. Okay, we are a back office, a back logistics backbone provider. I wish they would start focusing more on efficiency, right? Because they always like to say, oh, we do so much innovation for 20 billion. And I like to turn around and say, but you cost your customers 80 billion a year. Compared to that, the innovation quotient is very low. So how about reducing that 80 billion down to 60 billion? Now, how do you come up with those numbers, just in terms of the investment oh, the ecos- around? The, the yeah. ecosystem yeah, yeah, around yeah. SAP, you know, the data centers, the offshore application management. So you said spend a dollar system. on SAP license, you're going to spend four on all the other stuff around Every it. single year. Right, so I wish they would become a lot more aggressive about managing that ecosystem. You know, like Apple does. I mean, they go through a certification. Pro- they, they control that ecosystem pretty tight. Mm. SAP has very little control over its ecosystem. Right, so it's again. I've mentioned this every year for the last several years. I wish they would become more aggressive in managing the ecosystem around them. So you're more of an application guy. I'm more of an infrastructure person. So I can see how they could attack that infrastructure with things like virtualization. We had uh, a, a partner on before, uh, SAP Systems Integrator. He was talking about EMC's V-Block, which is a logical block of infrastructure, compute, storage, and networking. To that, I can see how they simplify that infrastructure layer. Uh, you're proposing a similar type of approach at the application layer? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you look at 
talk about infrastructure, right? I know for a fact some of the SAP customers are paying two and a half, three dollars a gigabyte a month to their outsourcers. If Amazon can do it for 15 cents, yeah. right? I mean, there is a benchmark out there. You, you, you're not just dreaming this stuff out there. They yeah. could be putting some pressure there. Yeah. If you look at application management, Salesforce.com supports 75,000 customers. Not, it's not the same footprint as, as, uh, as uh, SAP has, but 75,000 customers with a handful of people. Every SAP customer has got an offshore f provider doing hundreds of bodies, right? There is something dramatically off that you can bring multi-tenant concepts from the application world and kind of expect your partners to start doing some of that. Right. I wonder if I could get your perspective on, I mean, again, I'm more familiar with, let's say, for instance, PC software and the whole concept of bloatware, the vast majority of functionality in, in, in Microsoft Office we never need, we never use, and there's a whole suite of applications coming. I mean, I think of companies like 37 Signals that does project management. Right. I think, I mean, it's a simple, dead simple Agile, CRM, right? right? It's, a, it's fantastic. Does that same model uh, project into the enterprise world? I mean, or, or is that not the case because these big companies are using all this function. Is, it, is, is, is there similar kind of bloatware in the enterprise or is it just too, too valuable to pull the plug on those functions? It is, it is probably even more it's in the worse. enterprise world. Yes, yeah, it okay. is, right. Well, that's and, encouraging and then because that says a company like SAP could really truly innovate <laughs> by simplifying. Oh, the yeah. opportunities to, to innovate may not be the right term, they make more efficient yeah, yeah, you're right. It's not innovation. Count, it's it's it's, it's attack count, efficiency. Countless opportunities, yeah. right? And and this is where the research from the consumer tech world that I'm seeing is even more dramatic. You know, when you look at the efficiencies that the way the Facebook runs its data center or Amazon runs its supply chain, you go, why can't it happen in the enterprise? Yeah, right? and, and 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 why wouldn't? Um, new emerging enterprise software vendors take that Zing Zynga model and develop enterprise applications that are secure, that are functional. I mean, they're going to do that, right? right. I mean, this is inevitable. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, uh, or, or IT, when I say IT broadly defined, mm -hmm. not just the CIO, but all the ecosystem of vendors that makes up the IT spend are going to gradually become more and more trivial. So I think, I think SAP actually has a good chance of figuring this out because if they're developing all these applications for iPad, I mean, iPad users aren't going to accept anything but dead simple. Yeah. You buy that? Uh, yeah. uh, they just reject it. I mean, new form factor. Yeah. yeah. In, every, in every aspect of life. Yeah. All right, Vinny. Vinny Mershandani, uh, outstanding guest as usual. Really enjoy having you on. Appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your busy schedule. Um, the new Polymath is his book last year. The, 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 the tech switch hitter this year Later, um, later in the year. When, when is it coming out? Well, I'm not even finished with the research. So oh, okay. It, it, so you're the, in the and research and the, phase, and, and, so and, it'll, and, be, and the it'll publishing, be fall? Uh, yeah. yeah. Publishing world is a little old-fashioned. It takes a while to Good get... Good stocking <laughs> stuffer, folks out there, you know, looking right. for something for right. your significant other, your, 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 bus your child in business school, or your friend, or just yourself. So uh, treat yourself to, to the tech switch hitter, Vinny Mershandani. Look for that uh, this, later this year. Vinny, thanks very much Thank for coming you. on theCUBE. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Yep. Great thanks. to see you.